My talk is uh, called uh, Apple Apocalypse Now. It's a talk about AppLocker. Um, so before we dive into the material, just a quick overview of who I am. Uh, my name is Edward Mo. Some people call me the LOL father. Um, and that's basically because I was the one who started the LOLbass project. Uh, I also started uh, something called the Ultimate AppLocker Bypass List. Uh, so if you're into AppLocker, you have probably skimmed through that at some point in time in your career. Um, not going to talk a lot about myself, but uh, I work as a red teamer at Trustasec. Uh, I've been doing that for the last four and a half years. Um, so yeah, um, that's basically me. <laughs> uh, I want to not talk about me, I want to talk about AppLocker. That's what interests me today. Uh, so you might ask yourself why, Odvar, are you talking about AppLocker? Well, for me, AppLocker is a, is a product that is kind of misunderstood. I see it, I've seen it many times, it has been implemented with the false premise, uh, false premise that you kind of assume that it's do, doing more than you, ever, uh, than you imagine. So for me, it's important to kind of go through what AppLocker is and what it's not, so you kind of understand what you can use it for. It's a, it's a great product, but it's often mis misunderstood. I have, over my career, I, before I started working with security, I worked as an infrastructure consultant uh, doing Microsoft uh, stuff. Uh, so I have implemented AppLocker many times over. So I have, I would say I have a pretty good, decent amount of experience with AppLocker um, at customers. Uh, I haven't done much the last four years, four and a half years, because I'm a red teamer now, so I don't go and install AppLocker anymore. Um, but yeah, AppLocker is also often overlooked. It's, uh, as of now, it's actually free for everybody, uh, as long as you have a Windows uh, client. So that's nice. So everybody likes something that is free, I assume. <laughs> uh, and this talk is directed to both sides. So hopefully there will be something for the offensive side, but also something for the defensive side. So what I will cover today is I will give you an overview of AppLocker. I will also go over how to set it up and we will actually set it up from the ground up with the default rules, and I'll show you how easy it is. Uh, you'll probably, if you haven't seen it before, you will get astonished of how easy it is. And then, of course, we are going to dive into some techniques, how to bypass the default rules, and also how to mitigate the rules and maybe bypass them again and mitigate them again, and see how many times we can do that. Uh, and hopefully, if you have time in the end, I have a little surprise. We'll see. Little teaser. So AppLocker, that's one of Microsoft's approved list solutions. Uh, and as Jimmy talked about earlier, there are plenty more. So WDAC is one. Um, I'm really old. I'm like 40 years old. So I remember when we had software restriction policies. That was the first kind of approved list functionality that Microsoft had back in Server 2003. Um, so AppLocker is version two of that, basically. And there's a lot of improvements compared to the first uh, version. It did require enterprise and education screw previously, but as of Windows 10 2004, there's no requirement to have a specific SKU. You can run it on Pro, you can run it on Home, you can run it on everything, as long as it's Windows. So that's cool. And also, this is part of Microsoft's defense in-depth strategy. So it's like one of many products to harden the client as much as possible. And the way it's structured is that you define what is allowed or denied to run based on either a hash of a file or a certificate-based publisher rule, where you look at the binary and see it's signed and you see the publisher. So you can de deny or allow based on that. Or you can look at the path where it's located on disk. So we'll go over those in a minute. What is AppLocker? App, uh, what, is, what is AppLocker not? <laughs> it is not a security boundary. And over the years, many has tried to send um, send this to Microsoft, uh, claiming that they have a bypass. Uh, if they have found something interesting, they say this is for compliance only. It's not a security boundary. We don't consider it. And also, if you look at the defense in depth documentation, it clearly states that. This is part of uh, the defense in depth. It's not a product. It's not a boundary. They don't care. So if you bypass it, you will not get a CV. 
If you find a serious enough bug, they might fix it uh, still, but you will probably not never see a CVE for it. Also, in my opinion, it's not meant to protect admins because these are two example blog posts I have written where you can easily bypass AppLocker just being an admin on a box where you have AppLocker. And there are several other examples out there uh, on how to easily bypass AppLocker as an administrator. So it's meant for standard users. That's my opinion, at least. Let's set up AppLocker. You can even see my screen. Perfect. So I'm going to just quickly log into a domain controller. Everybody can see that. OK. Uh, so I am in the group policy management console. So I'm just going to go into a structure I pre-created where I have computers and users. I'm going to right click here to create a GPO and link it here. And we are just going to call this app locker. And the next step would be to go into edit mode. I'm going to maximize this so we can see it a little better. And then you need to navigate under policies, window settings, security settings, and you find something called application control policies. This is where you have the app locker configuration. This is where you live. And if you uh, extend that as well, you will see there are four sections, executable rules, Windows installer rules, script rules, and packaged app rules. So there's one thing missing here. What is that? DLLs. Um, so in order for AppLocker to be configured for DLLs, you need to enable that feature. So you go, go into Properties, you go into Advanced, and there's a big warning here that it affects performance. We don't really care, and it really doesn't affect the performance because AppLocker is smart and catches stuff, and yeah, it doesn't matter. And even if it would affect performance, I would still turn it on. All right, so uh, you can, from each section, you can create uh, rules manually, or you can uh, do automatically generate rules. Uh, I'll cover that a little later. But for now, we're just going to create the default rules for each section. So I'm going to do that real quick. And if we look at the uh, default rules for uh, binaries, they make kind of sense. So you see the default rule is that everything under Windows and everything under program files is allowed to execute. And also everything that an admin runs is allowed to execute. Um, and it kind of makes sense that an administrator is allowed to place files under the program files and the Windows files folder. So it makes sense. So I, I think the, the default rules kind of make sense because normally a user wouldn't be allowed to put anything in there. So. In order to put something in there, you need to be an administrator. So that's kind of the gist of the, the default rules. There are some exceptions. You have um, like packaged app rules. They just allow all signed packaged apps. And you also have the Windows installer rules. They basically allow everything that is signed digitally. And I'm probably, probably sure that most of you already understand that this is exploitable. <laughs> um, Another thing you need to do when you have configured your rules, you go into properties and then you configure each section of how you want to, uh, if you either want to enforce or you want to do audit. So if you want to deploy this in an organization, you probably want to start off with auditing, gather the logs and see how it will affect things. And then you switch to enforce mode when you're ready. So we're going to leave it in enforce mode. And there's also one additional thing. You need to go into um, the system services and you need to enable a service called the application identity service. This is what drives the app locker um, on, on the clients. That's it, we're done. <laughs> uh, sorry. And when you're done and you start to run things, that's not inside those folders, right? Like here, I'm, I'm running Prost mit bio. Uh, from C temp doesn't work. Even if we're in Germany, it doesn't work. Uh, so you get the app locker is blocking you. Um, if you double click, you get the blue message. If you write it from the terminal, it will say this program is blocked by group policy, meaning app locker. Um, if you have modern management and you want to use Intune for deploying app locker, 
I haven't, uh, I don't have a lot of experience with that, but the process is pretty much the same. You, you set up the rules the same, the way, the same way I did and adjust. And then you export the policy from the GUI. Then you go into the Intune portal, you create a new configuration profile, and you copy out the section you want to add into the Intune portal or Intune config profile, and then you deploy it. There's a link at the bottom if you are really interested in the nitty gritty details on how to do that. I'm going to leave that as an exercise for yourself. So where is the info stored? So we, when we deploy app locker policies, what, what happens on the client? First of all, it generates a bunch of files under system32 slash app locker. These are basically the, um, the rule files for app locker um, in a spe special format. You can view them, but it's kind of hard to read. So my preferred method is to go into uh, the registry instead because it saves, uh, saves it off in there. And it's under the SRP2 um, key, and they have one key for each section. And inside each key, there's one GUID for each rule. And if you go into the rule and you click on the value, you will get the XML part of the rule. That's the kind of the interesting part of the app lock configuration. So if you land on a client, you can easily export all the app locker rules and you can view them offline as long as you can dump the registry. Other setup types. So what I did now, I used the default rules. Another um, approach is that you can use um, to just trust publishers. So let's say you have 10 different publishers that install software on your machines. You can basically just trust them based on the certificate. Uh, so like everything from Microsoft, from Google, from Adobe, from Apple, from bank A, bank B, et cetera. I tried this and it's not a good idea because sooner or later you will realize that not everything is signed and you end up with exceptions and you end up with a hash exception and a path exception and you have 10 exceptions and you have 100 and sooner or later you just give up. So that's not a good approach. Um, Another approach is what I call the chaos approach. That's what I mentioned earlier, where you can do the automatically generate rules. And that's something you do from the client. You install GPMC, uh, and then you, then you run the um, automatically generate rules. The problem is that it will generate easily a couple of hundred rules. If you scan the disk, it will, <laughs> it will generate path rules for a file, sometimes a hash and assigning rule. It, depending, it depends on what it finds. So the rules that can become immensely large and you, you don't want that. You want to have control of the rules. If I were to start today with App Locker, I would start with Aaron Locker. That's a, a script, a set of scripts from Microsoft that automates uh, a lot of the process of building the rule set in a secure way. So most of the bypasses I'm talking about today is already handled by Aaron Locker. So you can run that, generate the rules, import them into the group policy, and you have a better rule set than the default rules. If you are interested in that, I have done some webinars with our, about this. Uh, you can go to YouTube, you can search on, uh, search on Trusted Sec App Locker, and I'm pretty sure you'll find my videos there. Um, so there's two hours of me going through App Locker, the basics and the more advanced setup. Uh, so if you want more details after this, go there or ask me. Yeah, it's an earthquake. PowerPoint is cool. So let's talk about bypasses. So one of the things when we talk about bypasses is that we need to look into permissions. Because if you look at the default rules, how we define them, everything on the windows and everything on the program files is allowed to run. So that's my kind of my minimum setup when it comes to AppLocker, the default rules. If I can bypass it using the default rules, it's a, it's a bypass, so to speak. Because you can set up AppLocker in so many ways, you need to have like a standard, and the standard for me is the default rules. So you would expect window, the Windows folder to be kind of hardened down, and you would also expect program files to be hardened down. The problem is with the program files is when you have third-party software and it gets installed in program files, you will often find, not very often, but sometimes you will find that they mess up the ACLs on either folders or files, and it can be exploited to bypass AppLocker. To, um, to check the permissions, you can use Access Check. It's a tool from SysInternals. Also, the slides will be available afterwards. So you don't have to type this URL now real quick. 
that's fine. You'll get it afterwards. Uh, but it's a link to a script I created, so you more easily can um, run and check the ACLs yourself. So in this file on, on GitHub, you can see that it's running access check for program files, program files 86, as well as the Windows folder. And it includes every identity you need to run in order to check the user. When you have done that, you might be surprised. You might see this. And you will definitely, if you haven't done this before, you might think, what the heck is going on here? Does the user have read and write to Windows folders? Yes, they do. That's true. They actually do. So as you can see, like if you see, see Windows tracing, we have read and write. Uh, we have system 32 spool drivers, color read and write. Um, it means that we can read things in there. That's obvious because we can read everything on the Windows for the most part. But we can also write stuff. But it doesn't tell me anything about the else, ACLs. It tells me just that I have a generic write permission. So this is the reaction I'm hoping for every time I show this. It barely happens, but it happens. So what specific ACLs are we looking for? I am looking for create files or create folders. Those are the most interesting one to me. And I'll explain that a little later. Why is that? But you also are looking for write data. That could be interesting. Might find that uh, you can overwrite the binary that you're allowed to execute. So you can like just pipe data into that file instead, or replace it. Um, you also want to have the ability to, or, or look at the ability to append data. It's pretty much the same as write. Uh, and last but not least, you want to look for execute file. That's a really interesting one. Obviously. If we look at the um, ACLs for the System32 spool drivers color folder, we can see that the users on the, that machine has traverse folder slash execute writes. That means they can execute files that are located inside that folder. They also have list folder, read attributes, read extended attributes, and also create files and write data. This is the most obvious bypass in the history of humankind. I can place a file in that folder, and I can run it. And I can bypass AppLocker because the default rules allows me to run anything under Windows. So how does that look? Here I'm just running auto runs from sysinternals from ctemp. You can see it's blocked by group policy. I then copy the file into the um, color folder, and then run it, and it executes. Nothing special there. Another example, here we have um, the tracing folder. As you can see, that the ACLs aren't exactly the same. I'm missing execute file. Okay, But I do have create files. I have create folders, write data, append data. So let's try. Let's copy, just copy the file straight up like we did before into the tracing folder. Try and run it. And no, I get access is denied. I don't get blocked by group policy or app locker, I get access denied. And that means it's the ACLs that is blocking the execution because I don't have any execution provisions on that file. Hmm, so where do we go from here? Let's try something silly. Let's see if we can just set it full with iCackles. I mean, that can't possibly work, right? We can't change ACLs on files under a Windows folder. That couldn't be possible. Yes, it can. And then you can even execute it afterwards. So you're either the one on the left or the one on the right right now. What is happening? Why could we change the ACLs? Yeah. The thing is, in Windows, we have something called an owner. So every time you create something in Windows, somebody becomes an owner. And when I created the file as my user account, I became the owner of that account. Make sense? And if you look at the tech documentation, an owner of an object always has the ability to read and change permissions on the object, meaning I can assign ACLs however I want because it's my object or my file. I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> so how do we meet to get this, these basic attacks? Well, you start off by creating a new rule. Uh, let's take the... Um, the, the tracing folder as an example. So create a new rule, 
and then you, you, you start up a wizard and you select if you want to allow or deny. So I'm going to choose deny. I'm going to select everyone. And then I'm going to choose a path rule. And then I'm going to specify the window tracing slash star. Everything under the tracing folder. Deny execution. Make sense? Yeah. And when you're done, it looks like this. You get an additional rule at the bottom. Deny everyone. Window tracing. Is it fixed? Do we need to do more? Let's check. <laughs> um, so we, we stopped at the iCackles and ran the other ones in the previous demo. So I'm doing GP update here to just to get the new rules applied. Uh, and then I'm trying to run other ones. And we can see it's blocked. So it works perfectly. However, or but, should I say, we can do like this. We can do type on a file. Then we can redirect that output into an alternate data stream. And the cool thing is, is, is that I have write access to the tracing folder. So I can append my binary directly to the folder in a different stream that you, you will not be able to see it in the explorer or something. And it won't change the size of the folder because it's hidden in NTFS. And then, Bob's your uncle, you can execute with WMIC, process call create, specify the alternate data stream path, and boom, we bypassed the deny rule. I felt this was suiting. If you look at the uh, task manager, it's pretty interesting. Tracing colon ADS <laughs> for the win. Um, and also I have uh, a source out there. Uh, I collect every time I find something that can execute from an alternate data stream or add to an alternate data stream. I have a, a gist where I add all those binaries in there. So you can kind of mix what to execute and what to add and all that stuff. Um, so to mitigate this, again, we, <laughs> we need to specify it uh, or add an additional rule. We need to add tracing uh, colon star. That's it. That blocks the alternate data streams from uh, allowing execution. When you are starting to define this, I mean, th this was one example, and it required two deny rules. So it will, the list will become pretty huge after some time. I recommend organizing your group policies slightly different than what you will find in any Microsoft documentation. What I prefer is to have one at the top, that is my allow rules. And for every kind of type of blockage I'm creating, I create separate group policies. Because the cool thing about App Blocker is that when you have multiple policies, it combines them in the end and creates a rule set and applies it. So it's better to organize it that way, in my opinion. In terms of script rules, there are some special things you need to be aware of. So by default, it handles uh, PowerShell scripts, BATS, CMD, Visual Basic Script, and JS. And it only handles the default built-in scripting engines in Windows. Um, and the interesting thing about PowerShell is that the scripts are not blocked. They are just changed. Like, when you try to run it, instead of running in a normal PowerShell mode, it will change the language mode, constrained language mode, meaning that you can only run a subset of commandlets. You cannot add type and do all the .NET stuff uh, that you want to do in order to abuse it. So AppLocker helps to lock down uh, the language mode of PowerShell. It doesn't block execution of scripts. Just good to know. And if you look at the source code to PowerShell, it gets interesting. Uh, so, uh, they, the, the way they do this to verify if app blockers in play or not is that they randomly create a script and a module and place it in a place where you're most likely not allowing execution from, meaning the temp folder for the user. And if it's not allowed to run, it's considered to be blocked by uh, app blocker and thereby constrained language mode. Yep. <laughs> This is the code. Uh, I'm not going to cover it in detail, but it looks for the temp path. Uh, then it creates a PS1, PSM1 uh, file with a random name. And then it tries to write, and it tries to execute. And if it fails, well, the bypass is pretty simple. That's what I'm saying. Uh, I found a bypass uh, in 2018. 
I have to refresh this for this talk. It still works. <laughs> so what you do is you change the temp variables, both of them, to a place you know you can write or run scripts. So you dump the app like a policy, you look at the script rules, and you see that you are allowed to run scripts in a specific folder. You change this, these variables to that place, and then you set from PowerShell, you set the variable names to, to point to that, and then you just invoke another PowerShell using those arguments, and boom, you have a full PowerShell language mode session going. Stupid simple. So the mitigation again is to be really careful about what sort of paths you allow scripts to run from and the user should not have write permissions to those folders. So you want to deny at least the folders you uh, uh, allow for execution. Uh, or yeah, if you use the default rules, you want to block like all the folders I just showed here so that the script can't run from there because the user can write to those folders and that's a bad thing. And you might be thinking, okay, Scripting engines, okay. What about macros? Nope. AppLocker doesn't handle macros. Meaning that you can execute code within Word or Excel. Um, so you have to find another solution to prevent uh, execution of uh, macros. They have some protection in place uh, in terms of you cannot spawn a binary file from the macro and set the specific flag you need to bypass app locker execution and stuff. Uh, but you can run code. I mean, there's like Kerberos VBA code out there that you can just paste in and run and get Kerberos tickets. I mean, yeah. Um, there, the same goes for other stuff. I mean, if Python is installed or Perl, app locker doesn't help you. Just good to know. When we look at the default installer rules, I kind of highlighted this a little already. Allowing all digitally signed Windows installer files, that's obviously not a good idea uh, because you can easily buy a coding, uh, signing, uh, code signing cert, or you could uh, borrow one from a leak or something. Um, it's not hard to get a file signed these days. Same goes for AppX. They, the default rule is to allow all signed package apps um, so that's not a good thing. Um, and as I said, you can either buy it, find one online, because there's been a lot of leaks lately with um, certs. And if you're a little creative, you will find some. Uh, example, MSF Venom or Metasploit can generate MSI files. They're malicious. You can sign them using a sign tool, and you can execute them using MSI exec, even remotely, if you want. The mitigations are... If you are using a CCM, I would look into managed installer. It's I kind of out of scope of this talk, but there are documentation online that allows you to say that uh, everything from a CCM is trusted and is allowed to be executed and installed on all the clients. That, that's a thing you can do. If you don't have a CCM and can use the managed installer, I would at least change the uh, MSI installer rules to only allow the vendors you actually trust to install. Uh, files on your system. Um, because, for instance, a user can install software without needing admin rights. So just be aware of that. And also, AppX, you shouldn't... I have debated this with Microsoft employees. I say that it's better to allow only from Microsoft because all the things you get from the store is signed from the Microsoft, uh, from the Microsoft certificate. Mm -hmm. So you shouldn't allow every signer that has signed an AppX to run. So you should at least change it to only allow Microsoft. That makes sense in my opinion. Or else you can create an AppX, you can drop it on disk that is signed, and you can run it. Also, um, you might be tempted by evil forces to use uh, exceptions when you are creating rules. It's evil, and I will show you why. There is a, a thing you can define in... Uh, in every rule is that you can have exceptions. So in this example here, um, I have an exception under the Windows folder that iCackles is not allowed to run. That makes sense, right? I'm blocking iCackles. Or any other binary, it doesn't really matter what binary, but you get the point. And you also see that there's an additional rule here. Allow everyone signed by Microsoft. 
So the strange thing, and I have troubleshoot this plenty of times, is that this will actually allow iCackles to run. And it's super frustrating because you're using exceptions. And when you have a large rule set, it's super hard to kind of figure that out. So my recommendation is, clear: don't use exceptions, use specific deny rules. And also allowing everything from Microsoft to run is a bad idea in itself. There's plenty of binaries out there, as you've probably seen on previous talks, uh, that can run code. Um, here's just a few, install util, MS build, MS HDI, regasm. There's a, a list, or there are two, multiple lists. We have the Lullbash project, we have the uh, ultimate app locker bypass list that has some of these files. Uh, Lullbash is probably the most updated. Um, so be careful when you allow things from Microsoft to run. I have in the uh, GitHub repo, the ultimate app blocker bypass list, I have XMLs, like rule files for all the malicious binaries I found at that date. Uh, I don't suggest that you import them and run them in production right away. Uh, they might break things because I'm blocking everything, everything I can think of. So it's more of a template to add rules that makes sense. Um, so I just found uh, that was an easy way for me to keep them up to date. So to summarize my recommendations, you should um, try to use the uh, default rules um, if you're starting out. I, I would start small in the lab, try the default rules, adjust, uh, adapt, try see if it works, roll it out to, to a bigger scale, use audit mode for a while, see and collect the logs, see what happens, and then turn on the enforce. However, if you're not comfortable doing that, I would strongly recommend that you use Aaron Lockman instead. Read the documentation. It helps a lot to uh, ensure that you get a more secure rule set instead of relying on random things you figure out yourself. Um, so that, that's at least a better starting point, in my opinion, to Iron Locker, import that, and start from there. And always, 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 always enable DLLs, no matter what other people are saying. There might be some rare cases where this might affect something, but that's mostly due to poorly programming on the application itself, how it handles DLLs. But normally it shouldn't affect performance. And as you probably understood, I hate exceptions. So don't use them, although I told you to. So, and also create deny path rules for paths that users can write to and make sure to include alternate data streams, please. And also to block all these bad, bin bad binaries, make sure to use the publisher rules uh, so you can block MS build, MS HCA, all the nasty stuff. You don't want those running on the clients anyway. So might as well block them. And change the rules, as I said, only allow signers, uh, change the rules that allows all signers on MSI and AppX packages. And uh, last but not least, I want you to remember that AppLocker is not something that stops everything here in the world. But just by creating the default rules, applying that, I'm pretty sure it will stop 70, 80% of ransomware attacks right off the bat. That's at least what I've been told. <laughs> uh, but again, to me, it's a low bar to get this going, and it's a big win. And to kind of spin further on this, this is uh, in my webinar as well. If you collect the log centrally, you get insights on what users tries, tries to execute, and that's super helpful. And you can even un, uh, detect some nasty stuff when you start to dig. All right, I promised a little surprise. I have six minutes left, so that's perfect. I have uh, been nasty. <laughs> um, I have actually created a Microsoft Store app uh, that was legitimate, that looks legitimate. It's a security checker tool. It's only published to me uh, or the people I invite, so it's, it's not something that's out to everybody. So you can't find it, but I have decided to, to blur it out so I don't spoil anything because it's associated with my personal account and I don't want to get into any trouble. Uh, so I created a first one, it came through, it got reviewed by Microsoft, everything was okay. And then I did some changes afterwards and made an update. So now I can do some cool stuff. Uh, so this is, um, this is just a, a client. 
obviously, uh, that is protected by our blocker. I'm just running binaries, uh, nothing super fancy here. Uh, and then I'm going to just pull in the web server console. Uh, and remember, this is just a stupid, simple um, proof of concept. So I have a text file hosted on an external server. As you can see, this is some C sharp code. I'm basically just pulling some environmental variables and popping a message box. Nothing fancy at all, but uh, it proves a point. So, um, of course, I have to show you with the narrow as well that I'm, what I'm doing. And then we go back to the client. And then I um, start my installed MS Store app. And then it starts to run. Then it pulls the additional file. And. You can code execution. I don't write this stuff. So that's pretty cool. I think that's the first time I've seen a store app get um, abused that way. I've heard many times people say that it's not possible because they have a strict review process at Microsoft, yada, yada, yada. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. I have some uh, additional resources I've included in the slides if you need. Uh, they will be available afterwards. Um, if you have any questions, you can either ask them now or you can whoops, ask me later. I'll be here today and a little, a few hours tomorrow as well. So, any questions? There's a question all the way in the back. And my hearing is super bad, so this will be interesting. Oh, you got a microphone. Thank you very much for your talk. I have a question regarding AppLocker and Windows Defender Application Guard. Um, last time I read, Microsoft uh, said they should be implemented in parallel with the Windows Defender application guard running the rough, uh, the rough security uh, for the whole uh, corporation and the app locker for fine tuning. What is your experience with this? I have almost zero experience with the application guard, to be honest. Um, but to me, it makes sense to have both. Um, I mean, no solution is perfect, even for Microsoft. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm not 100% sure how you would kind of combine those two. Um, so I, I don't have a good answer for you. I can, of course, check um, if you want and get back to you. I, I know a lot of people that works with security <laughs> and these products, so they might give you a better answer than what I can provide to you for, for you today. So thanks for the question. Wonderful. Thank you. We just lock. Yeah, that's fine. Just take. Uh, if there are third-party applications uh, which uh, rely on a system call, uh, or say, in German, angreifbar, like this uh, app. At a so if uh, a syscall is attackable, oh, I mean, AppLocker is for user land things. So it's for user only. So if it's a service or something that you're thinking of that runs as a system account or a higher privileged account, AppLocker doesn't interfere with that. But if it's like a, a thing you run from the user and it's a syscall, uh, I don't think it should be a problem, but it might block if it's running the LLs and stuff, but it's not looking into specific hooks into the kernel and stuff. No, so it's not protecting that way. Uh, we have heard uh, um, examples with say uh, EDL uh, mm. hooking and uh, attacker can uh, disable this uh, mechanism. And uh, if Apple is uh, uh, hookable or un unhookable, uh, a third party uh, could uh, work like that uh, without the system. Um, I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question entirely. So, uh, my English is... Uh, no, no, no problem. Uh, so, so what you're afraid of is somebody unhooking AppLocker or hooking into AppLocker? Uh, no, uh, I uh, wanted to ask uh, if a third-party tool can um, implement a mechanism like AppLocker oh. but without... Uh, relying on the system. Yeah, so you have, um, you're probably thinking about EDRs, uh, EDR systems. They look at syscalls and, and things 
that hooks into the kernel, um, and they could block it at a better level than AppLocker could, for sure. With black or white listing. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure CrowdStrike or Carbon Black or any of the other ones have lists that, can, that you can fine tune with your own binaries and hooks or calls to the kernel that you don't want to happen. Um, so yeah, but uh, AppLocker doesn't have that functionality. <laughs> Sorry? Code yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Windows Defender uh, application control, of course, is way better uh, in terms of what you were asking. Of course, I didn't even think of it. Yeah, Microsoft has solutions for that as well. <laughs> Thanks, Hassan. All right. Uh, thank you for your awesome talk, Otwa. It was, again, a pleasure to hear it.